Welcome everyone to this uh, event tonight at the Museum of Natural History. It's a pleasure to um, see you all tonight. We actually have some people joining online. We have two panelists joining us online. And we also have quite a few people, I think, joining us via Zoom. So just so that you're aware. Um, this event is organized by the University of Oxford's REACH program and the Stockholm Environment Institute. And it's part of the Fairwater exhibition, which is hosted here at the museum. Some of you may have the chance, have had the chance to visit it. It's located on the upper gallery of, of the museum. And uh, Fairwater is a collaboration between the Museum of Natural History and the REACH program. And it goes on until September. Um, so yes, welcome everyone. We're delighted to see you all. And as we're kickstarting, I'd just uh, like to get a bit of a, of a sense of um, where you're coming from and, and you know, what you work on. And I'm just curious to know how many people in the audience work or study uh, on climate change related issues. If you could kind of raise your hand, high, 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 so we can see. And anyone working on climate adaptation specifically, if you can raise your hand, high, high, high. Okay. Anyone who doesn't work at all on climate change? Uh, okay. Okay. So quite, quite a few. Okay. Good mix. Good mix. Um, so today we'll be talking about water, uh, the theme of the exhibition, and climate change. There's a, a big overlap. According to the uh, United Nations, uh, the climate crisis is primarily a water crisis as uh, with the warming primarily affecting the water cycle and that causes more droughts, uh, more floods, more storms and unpredictable weather. Um, as many of you might know, there's a devastating drought taking place at the moment in southern Africa, affecting 25 million, over 24 million people. And um, Zambia, Zimbabwe and Malawi have declared state of disaster. And we have one of our panelists, Bettina Cole, is joining us online from southern Africa. So maybe that's something that she'll be able to, uh, to bring into her conversation tonight. Um, but really why we're having this conversation tonight is because those who are most affected by these disasters are um, vulnerable communities, marginalized communities, uh, communities, um, uh, poor communities, and, and, and they're also the ones who have the least means to adapt to climate change. And we're really in this event tonight, we're going to dive into how um, science can best support those marginalized communities. And uh, on the one hand, we know that science is necessary to better understand uh, where climate change is happening and how and who it's affecting. And, and we need science in order to inform decision making. But on the other hand, there are many political, social, financial barriers to using, uh, uh, to producing, using, interpreting, accessing that science. So that's why we have uh, some great speakers and panelists tonight that I'll be introducing shortly. Uh, but also be mindful that we have some of our audience joining online. Um, and the agenda for the evening will be uh, that we'll have Ellen Dyer and Sakina Bawani sharing very short presentation and we'll then invite our three panelists and there will be time at the end for Q&A. So without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Ellen Dyer, who's our first speaker tonight. Um, Ellen is a climate scientist who specializes in African climate system. She directs the Palm Trees program uh, across South Africa, Cameroon, Ghana, Kenya, Nigeria, and DRC. The program aims to equip marginalized communities to better respond to extreme climatic events in Africa, such as floods, droughts, and heat waves. And she also leads climate research as part of the REACH program in Ethiopia and Kenya. Ellen, over to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so I'm going to take us through just a few slides just to set up some themes for the rest of the evening. Um, and so we are interested in climate change and water. Um, climate change uh, is inextricably linked with water, as um, Alice said. Can we go to the next slide, please? Oh, no. Um, it, it will affect more water in many different ways. Some of these are uh, physical changes. So for example, the increase or 
increased extremes of flash floods and flash floods, droughts, and something called flash droughts, which is a new um, type of extreme that is becoming much more common, and also extremes like extreme heat. And it's not just the physical changes that are important, but these are the context in which people interact with uh, water in their daily lives. So this will really affect how much water is available um, because of how much rainfall there is, but also of how much evaporation is going to happen when you have that rainfall. Um, also, this will also affect water access. So this is the physical context in which people are either um, getting water delivered to them or having to go out and actually fetch that water themselves. It will also affect water safety um, because of changing um, temperatures, changing amounts of rainwater that is infiltrating, um, and water being sort of located in different places because we've changed the distribution of water on the surface of the earth. Um, you can have a lot of change in terms of different um, waterborne diseases that are going to be more or less common in, in new areas. So this is sort of the, the basic link between climate change and water. Um, but the reason why we want to understand these links very carefully is that we would like to adapt well to climate change um, or to build climate resilience. And climate adaptation and climate resilience are sort of connected terms that maybe we can dive into a little bit later, the nuance of those. But the idea is to plan instead of just be reacting constantly. And to do that, we do need to have some climate information to facilitate this planning. So this can come in the form of climate models, which Elise already um, noted the IPCC reports. Um, but this can also be a different time scale. So not necessarily just to the end of the century, but good forecasts for a seasonal outlook, for example, or a monthly outlook. But also different types of information that are more accessible or nuanced and contextually specific, such as traditional climate information or indigenous forecasts or people's experience of the climate itself. So all of this forms climate information that we need to use for uh, climate adaptation and to build resilience. But this is where we get to some of the interesting questions about at the margins, which is one of the themes of tonight's talks or panel. Um, and that is, we sort of get embroiled in some of the norms of producing and using climate information. So who makes this information? Who is it made for? Um, who can access it? And what is it made for? Um, I think in our own lives, we can think about how we interact with climate information on a daily basis or to make plans. Um, and in different locations, that will be quite different. Um, and I think we will dive into some of the intersectional ways in which we have to think about who is accessing climate information, who has the power to access it, um, and also whether it's actually useful or made with different groups of people in mind. And this is a big focus of some work that we've been doing in REACH in uh, the WISER project to understand who does climate information actually get to the last mile at the individual level in communities, um, and can they use it? Is it important to them? Um, and also to think about how people's identities and social socioeconomic contexts really influence that. Um, that's a big focus of the, the Palm Trees project that Alice mentioned earlier. Uh, and this feeds back into the goal of building climate resilience and doing climate adaptation. Are we just trying to understand what the future will be? Are we future proofing against future physical conditions? Um, or are we trying to build a little bit of climate justice by understanding the context and nuance that people are experiencing now um, so that we can do more equitable resilience building in the future? Uh, so that's where I will end now and hand it over to Sikena. Thank you. I'll just briefly introduce Sakena before passing on the, the mic. So, so Dr. Sakena Barwani is an interdisciplinary senior researcher at the Stockholm Environment Institute with a background in both social anthropology and computer science. She also directs Readapt, SCI's pioneering global platform for knowledge exchange on climate change adaptation. Thank you, Alice. Hi, everybody. So after that great introduction by Ellen, I just wanted to go into a little bit of detail on um, some of the research that we're doing at SEI um, in Oxford. So we're based in the locally for, for everybody here who's from the city. We're based in Oxford and some of the social science research that we do helps to bridge this 
um, intersect with the climate science and really trying to understand what the role of climate science is for people living at the margins and for those trying to better understand the lived experience of people in the, living at the margins. And so we do think about all of these more formal methods. Historically, we've done a lot of work around modeling ourselves, but different types of modeling and different types of decision support approaches that try to predict and analyze what risks are. But this has very much always been driven by really understanding what is going on at the local level. And so doing a lot of ethnographic work, a lot of field work to understand what are the drivers of vulnerability and to do a lot of knowledge co-production. So bringing together people who can, who, who we can work with to understand what these norms and values and preferences are that Ellen referred to in trying to um, make decisions around climate change, but also in trying to interpret, analyze, access, and use this climate information. Um, I haven't, I'm not one of the panelists here. I don't want to take time away from the panelists. So I, I'm going to just basically put a lot of links here to research that we've been doing. Um, and some of this actually is with one of our panelists, Bettina, who may refer to some of this work in Zambia that we did together. But this is very interesting research trying to bring together a very disciplinary set of actors around a table to understand how and why decisions get made, whether multiple knowledge systems are included in decision making processes, whether different actors' voices are included, and designing processes to actually make this work. And this was a very interesting project, Fractal, which is a precursor to the Palm Trees project Ellen mentioned which involved a lot of embedded researchers working in cities, in, in nine Southern African cities, really trying to understand the um, water risk context of the cities and um, actually focusing on um, peri-urban areas and looking at water risks there and water security. And without that lived experience understanding of those cities, um, the project really wouldn't have been very successful. Um, so this obviously involves a lot of participatory processes, and it, it does involve working with climate scientists, hydrologists, modelers, um, but really trying to unpack that black box of decision making or the black box of modeling to better understand how decisions can inform that modeling. Um, and a lot of this involves systems thinking and really um, breaking down assumptions in a lot of these models by bringing in the lived experience of marginalized groups. Um, obviously, it's very complex. We are, as Alice mentioned, there's a lot of political and social and financial constraints to this. Understanding the institutional context and there's lots of fun, interactive, um, serious gaming kinds of ways that we've tried to do that in collaboration with um, partners. And um, this has resulted in a knowledge co-production framework that we've designed to help others carry out the same kinds of processes with some really practical guidance. So this is our tandem guidance. You can find that online. And having applied that in nine Southern African cities, we're now applying that in a European project in four regions um, to think about how this data modeling, communication and governance can be made more interoperable. And so this is also a really interesting project if anyone wants to take a look at that. And finally, I just want to say that we also at SCI Oxford um, lead the Weird App platform, as Alice mentioned, and this is um, a platform for sharing your climate adaptation projects globally with a huge community um, online. And the map there that you can see is a map of case studies that shows um, the projects going on around the world on adaptation. And these are from very local level projects through to national level studies. And anyone can share their projects online. So the idea is that we really want to accelerate climate action by helping people learn from what's already been done well, from how people have overcome challenges, and um, from knowing like what works and what doesn't work, basically. And Alice has led the launch of a water security theme. Um, it was launched last week, I think. And so again, this is a brilliant place to share your work if you'd like to give it more visibility. And with that, I think I'll hand back to the panel. And to Alice. And I'll take the mic as well. Thank you to Ellen and, and Sakena uh, for these great introductions. So now we're going to dive straight into um, our panel discussion. And we have three panelists, uh, Dr. Doris Ago, we have Bettina Kole, and Alice, Dr. Alice Odingo. I'm going to introduce them, and then I'll ask them uh, a question. And I'm going to start with Doris. 
Um, let me. So Doris Ago, if I pronounce your name correctly, Ago, Doris Ago, is an international consultant and a visiting research fellow at the Grantham Institute, Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment at LSC in London. And her work cover, covers various sustainable development goals such as climate action, water, sanitation, hygiene, gender equality, food security and health. And she's also currently working as part of the BASIN research program at LSE, which uses behavioral science and psychology approaches to tackle, tackle climate change and water security in Africa. Um, so my first question to you, Doris, is if you could set the stage perhaps for our audience um, by explaining why and how climate and water issues especially impact marginalized groups and, and why really this is crucial to understand these aspects when we plan for climate adaptation. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Helene. I'm really happy to be here and be a part of this panel. Um, your question um, makes me think of the critical, how critical it is for us to understand the geographies of um, vulnerable communities, especially the marginalized communities, uh, because it's important to understand where they come from and where is the settings they are. So I have spent a lot of years working in Africa in different geographical settings, particularly in uh, Southern Eastern African region. And I've really, really come to appreciate that it's important to understand that climate affects certain social, ecological, and political landscape. And within those landscape, we need to understand that people are uh, affected differently. And there's so many factors that influence the way they are affected. So it could be their level of education, it could be a literacy level, it could be their livelihood options. And this is so important. So um, going back to the geography, we really do understand that across the world, a lot of the marginalized people um, and vulnerable people, they live in very special environment. And within this environment, they're also very challenging environmental conditions. So I do remember my ever first time to work in the, the dry land communities, uh, which is in, in south northwestern Kenya. And I remember how amazed I was and also really, really surprised. And I was shocked at the environmental conditions there. And I thought, do people actually live here? Because I just remember it was extremely hot. It was really dry. It was windy and it was so dusty. And I thought, I'm a celebrity. Get me out of here. I can't. This is really hard. But, you know, within a few days, I actually adapted to. But what is so important to understand is that these environments, they're very remote. And so the level of investment um, in terms of infrastructure and social services is very poor, so it's very low. So the various uh, services, the basic services that we enjoy, like good roads, electricity, water supply system, healthcare facilities, some of them we take for granted. They are just so rare in this environment. So this is a real important factor when we're thinking of adaptation. These people do not have access to these social services and infrastructure. So whatever happens when a climate disaster or a disaster strike them, they just cannot cope. So that is one important thing to understand and to remember. The other thing on top of that is that these environments, um, they, they live in a very, um, the political uh, environment and the social environment is very unstable. So think of war, the countries that are you know, affected by war and conflict. So the areas that I've worked in, especially like in the pastoralist community, there's a lot of conflicts uh, in these areas. So where there are conflicts um, between uh, the different tribal uh, communities, um, access to resources is really limited. And so people are fighting all the time. So market systems, nothing works. So this is so important. So this is why they become very vulnerable as well because they don't have access to markets as well. And the second thing, um, the other thing why these people are so vulnerable is because uh, of very limited livelihood option. 
So if you talk, for example, the pastoralist community, all they know is to do a cattle and livestock keeping. So if you try to introduce uh, another kind of livelihood option, it doesn't really work because the environmental conditions, the prevailing conditions do not allow them to do any other activity. This is why the pastoralist community hold on into their livestock, you know, hundreds and hundreds of goats and sheep, because that is the only one livelihood that they know. So just having one single livelihood also doesn't help. So when something like prolonged drought hits them, it's just hundreds of livestock die. So that is another thing which is really dangerous for, the, uh, for these communities. And the last one is that within these areas where climate uh, really affects the community, they, uh, there's a lot of human rights violation and also environmental and human injustices. And property rights is very insecure. So my recent work working in the informal settlements, for example, in urban settlements in Nairobi, um, they're constantly evicted from their, from their homes. People have shanty shelters and they're building houses and the structures are within the illegal settlements. So imagine that when there's floods, the evictions as well as on top of that, the floods are there, people don't have homes where to live. And so all these factors really make you know, these communities really quite vulnerable. And so the impact is huge. And there's a lot of impacts ranging from health, you know, food security, for example, for the pastoralist community when they cannot, um, the livestock die. So mal malnutrition is really, the level of malnutrition is very high, especially for children and uh, under fives and women and the elderly people and also um, diseases like cholera, you know, during drought is really, really prevalent in these areas. So the, the range of you know, this vulnerable community on top of all these things that are happening when climate strikes is just so terrible for them. And so they cannot cope. Thank you. Thank you, Doris. Really, really interesting. And thanks for sharing your, your experiences and your expertise. I'd like to now uh, pass on the floor to Bettina Kole, who is uh, joining us online. Um, and Bettina is a senior learning specialist with the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Center. And for those of you who don't know the Climate Center, uh, it, it supports the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement to understand and address the humanitarian consequences of climate change and extreme weather events. So very relevant to our conversation tonight. Uh, and one of their core objectives is to make the best global scientific insight operable at the local level. Um, so Bettina, I'd like, I would like, I would now like to turn to you and um, ask you to maybe give us an, an overview of how climate information is, is used, who are the different sort of actors that use climate information and how it's applied to support climate adaptation. And if in your response, if you can weave in the work that the Climate Center has been doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, thank you also, Doris, for uh, setting the stage so beautifully. I think we understand the complexity. We're looking at compound and cascading risk. And I think we got a good sense uh, from your presentation, Doris, about the complexity that we're dealing with. We're not dealing with a single event. We're dealing with how that affects a whole social fabric, a community, a really complex um, existing system. So... So when we talk about climate information, it's quite interesting to distinguish maybe what type of information would be useful in what context. So we have a lot of scientific evidence. We have a lot of scientific models and forecasts. And the question is really, as I think already Alice alluded to, is that we need to understand what matters to the local communities. So, for example, the, the pastoralist from Doris that Doris was referring to, is it that an extreme drought matters? Is it an extreme drought of a month? Or is it an extreme drought over a consecutive number of years? We need to understand where is some resilience and where are limits to adaptation? Because I think there are a lot of strategies that people have um, evolved with and devised over, the, over time to deal with some climatic extremes. The question is really, 
um, how can we increase that resilience and how can we understand what changes will be coming in the future? May they be climatic or non-climate changes um, that we are expecting? So when we look at extreme weather events, we need to understand for a particular community, is it long rains that are particularly terrible, extreme heat waves or long droughts? And what is a long drought that is particularly causing a catastrophic um, effect for livelihoods and affects people's lives? So for this, we need to understand the systems. And I think um, we heard earlier in the introduction also how understanding systems is important. It's really much harder uh, to do in practice than um, we might think. And uh, this is why we we use the um, to say, bring stakeholders into the room to understand together. Where do we feel our systems um, vulnerable? Where do we feel um, particular weather events would really have um, a particularly um, terrible effect on most vulnerable groups? And what can we do about this? So we have a range of project pr uh, products, global forecasts, short-term forecasts. A lot of them are open access. And sometimes the real challenge is actually to select which climate information is relevant. How do we understand the uncertainty that is attached to some of the climate information? And how do we nevertheless come up with robust and sound ways forward um, in terms of taking practical action to um, be more resilient? And I think uh, um, I think it was Ellen also in the beginning who said, maybe the current state is not the most desirable state that communities find themselves in or the most vulnerable find themselves in. So can we also be a bit courageous and say, what is a desirable state that we'd like to achieve and include a climate justice element here? But uh, when we are thinking about responses, we need to understand what are we talking about? Are we talking about water issues? Is it not enough water? Is it too much water in, for, in, term, in forms of floods? Is it maybe enough water, but not of the right quality, looking at drinking water shortages, for example, in some parts of the world? And um, I think understanding this really is important to look at the time scale. And I want to just quickly sketch three areas uh, where I think we're currently working and looking at different time scales. So the one is thinking about climate information triggers before a disaster is happening. So we call this anticipatory action. And we're basically saying, we know a particular event is particularly critical for a particularly vulnerable group. We can, we can, we can understand what is a trigger to have some humanitarian action being put in place before the disaster occurs. So that when we, for example, have a flooding event, um, there people are prepared, we um, have much more effective uh, support in place, and um, the suffering can be less. Of course, it's sometimes harder to um, anticipate uh, what is a trigger, and you might take action without a disaster actually occurring. So this is something um, that um, we are wrestling with here. But I think in some instances, it works very well. When we have upstream flooding, we can have a trigger mark where we actually are pretty confident that downstream um, villages, for example, or fields um, might be flooded. And um, ideally, the communities have worked before the, the event together to say, if this event occurs, these are the measures we would like to be taking. This is the support that will be provided. And so that, that aid can flow quite effectively and strategies can be implemented effectively before an event strikes. The second one is seasons. And uh, we heard about seasonal droughts in Southern Africa. Um, we heard also maybe about extreme heat in West Africa um, that has really huge impact on um, people's health. Um, and there maybe some of you are also aware of, sometimes we are more vulnerable than we think. Maybe some of you can remember in 2018, in Cape Town, 
the city nearly ran out of water. We called it day zero, and it was very close for the city to run out of water. And there was quite a lot of concern that this would unravel the social fabric, not just that people wouldn't have enough water, but basically that the social fabric would unravel um, in an unprecedented way. And uh, so understanding seasons is really important and understanding also extreme events becomes increasingly important. And I think we can now say with, with quite a lot of certainty that these extreme events will come become more frequent, they will become more severe. And we actually have a pretty good idea what we need to be bracing ourselves for. And that brings me to the third time um, horizon that I wanted to touch on, and that is the long-term time horizon. We often speak about immediate or maybe season or maybe a couple of years. And I think I would like to advocate and say, if we really want to be serious about adaptation and building resilience, we need to think about timeframes of several generations. We cannot only think about a seasonal timeframe. So, um, a lot of the global climate models will say if we are mitigating in a certain pathway, then we have a pretty good idea of um, what some of the challenges are that we're dealing with in different regions. They will be different. There is quite a lot of uncertainty about what that means. And there are ways to navigate that uncertainty. And I really want to say that it's really crucial that we that we tackle that challenge and say, we cannot avoid thinking about the long-term consequences because otherwise a lot of the actions that we're taking now will be very short-lived and um, we really need to think strategically um, into the future. So sometimes I'm asked, so what is the climate sense what Red Cross and we are supporting a lot of the Red Cross and Red Crescent National Societies. Oh dear, can you still hear me? Okay. Okay. All right. Um, so the Red Cross and Red Crescent National Societies um, are supported by us to really see how we can include climate information in locally led um, um, adaptation on the ground. We're also supporting the ICRC in, in uh, on the climate and conflict nexus. I think we also heard from Doris that um, we need to really understand the complexity and often areas of conflict are also um, suffering extreme climate and we need to understand this better and unpack the systems. And we also work with a range of partners to find innovative solutions to complex problems. So bringing to bear the, the science, the practice, the policy with the innovation um, is really the important aspect here. So we, for example, did the work in Osaka where we looked at how does the city, um, how is the city affected? How is the infrastructure um, going to be enough for water demand in the coming years? Is there enough water available? And um, taking action together. Um, thinking about the short term, the medium and the long term, especially when we think about infrastructure, we absolutely need to think about the long term time horizons. Um, and maybe just to flag a couple of approaches to close, we're working with also storylines and how can we tell better stories about the futures that we might be encountering, um, looking at climate risk narratives to say, so we are not entirely sure what the future will bring in 30 years time, but we are, have quite a good idea of the envelope that we might be encountering. So can we look at that envelope and see how we can actually be more resilient in a way that is not just catching up where things are already not great, but to really improve systems and think with a positive vision about what we can be doing in the long term. And I want to say complex problems uh, need innovative solutions. We need to deal with the complexity. And uh, I'm so pleased to see um, on the WeAdapt platform that there's a lot of work done out there. There is amazing technology available. And I think it is really very good also to um, think a little bit about how we can take action right now with what we've got 
along these different time horizons. Thank you so much, Bettina, for uh, framing this topic so well in the short time that you had. Um, and then finally, we're going to move on to Dr. Alice Odingo, who very unfortunately, she was supposed to be uh, visiting the UK, but unfortunately, um, she couldn't get the visa on time. So we apologize. We, we, we miss you here, Alice, but it's great that you're able to join us online. Um, so uh, Dr. Alice Oluoko Odingo is an associate professor in the Department of Geography, Population and Environmental Studies at the University of Nairobi. There she's also the chairperson for the Gender Equity and Inclusion Main Mainstreaming Committee. And she's also a social research lead and gender focal person for the Palm Trees project program that we heard Ellen speak about earlier. And so we had Doris set the stage by uh, presenting how climate and water issues affect marginalized groups. And then Bettina spoke to us about um, how climate information is used and the role of climate information. And then the final question as I turn to you, Alice, it's actually a twofold, twofold question. Um, firstly, if you could dive into the, the, or tell us what the political and social barriers to supporting adaptation for marginalized groups, and then whether you could speak about how those marginalized groups could also be more actively involved in that process. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I think uh, the, the first speakers have actually done very well by opening the scene for me. And I want to recall that in 2015, we were very happy when we launched the SDGs. And uh, one of the issues was that nobody will be left behind. And uh, that meant that there'll be no gender inequalities, there'll be no hunger and poverty, livelihoods will be improved and people will have better lives. But today is 2024, but still a number of people are still marginalized. And not because we don't have climate information. I know IPCC has got many reports and uh, like you said, the Met Office, a lot of climate is there, but do the marginalized get this information? Does it reach them? Do they use it? That's my question that I keep asking myself. And it is because we have some political and social barriers that make these people not use even what is already there for them. And these barriers, they can be at global level, at national level, and at the local level. If we think of the political barriers, for example, we, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the global level, there's the issue of mitigation, where we emphasize the reducing greenhouse gas emissions and then turning away from fossil fuels, yet a number of people are still suffering from floods, from droughts and heat stress that need attention and then this gets you know, put aside. At the, at the same time, we are focusing on the current extremes when, again, people suffer from different things in different places at the global level. At the same time, the voices of certain groups are not all, always heard, but at the low income and middle income countries, their voices are not, in, are not properly captured, for example, in, in the COPs or at the, at the UNEP level. So they are actually missing a voice there. And those regions have got a number of marginalized communities. At the same time, the finance is not linked to the, to the vulnerabilities. So you find that a location of finance is not targeting those who are poor for adaptation. And that brings a mismatch at the global level. Then at the national level, again, the political factors, there are still problems of leadership and also possibility of coordination of different groups to bring them together to work on adaptation. And also we do not, we do not look at the, the, the neglected communities. Adaptation policy does not focus on those who are at the margins, but maybe because of certain factors, they still remain away. And at the same time, we don't prioritize resilience. And uh, here in case, uh, actually Ellen mentioned something about resilience and then she stopped, uh, where we want people to, to, to be more resilient, for example, the fisher, the, the fisher, small fisher community, the agropastoralists, the, those people who live on the marginal lands, we, ne we need to make their lives more resilient to be able to, uh, to adapt to climate change, but the focus is not there. 
That is at the, at the global and then so at the national level. But now when you come to the social aspect, we have mentioned a number of people who are marginalized by social, well, social barriers and this, this causes, causes them to, to be marginalized. For example, there are others who are segregated on the basis of being labeled as gangs, particularly in regions under war and violence. And this group, because they're used to violence, they still relate with the women and girls. And these women near them suffer a lot because they are abused, they are violated, and then they remain still marginalized. At the same time, we have people who are discriminated against because of their norms and culture. The culture may not allow women to, to carry certain responsibilities, even to attend some meetings. So they miss the information, they miss the opportunities for, you know, for, for support, and they are left at the, at the back seat. That's another challenge they have. Some, some of these people are also, some of them are sick, they're under care, and they cannot be able to, to reach out for help. So they are still remaining marginalized. And, what, and water is one of those issues that every marginalized community suffers from its lack. They don't get enough water or in terms of access, the quality, and also the just security of water ar around their space. So these are challenges or barriers that actually are, 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 are challenges to adaptation itself because it has not been able to reach those people who are greatly in need. So, but how, how do we, how would we handle these barriers even at those various levels? If we look at the global picture, for example, we, we can say that we can bring in the low and middle income countries voice more at the UN level. And in this case, for example, we can have UNEP having three functions. The one, Environment Assembly, the second one, in Environmental Court, and the third one, to be able to, to bring research at that level. In all these three functions, they should go from regional to national and to local, so that everybody is included and is able to prosecute environmental crimes, is also able to, to carry out research and make sure it is taken to the regional, national, and local level, and everybody access that research. At the same time, they're able to advise the financial institutions to support green projects so that they avoid polluting those project, polluting projects. At, at, at national level, again, we can have countries being able to embrace the people who are disadvantaged and tailor the adaptation funds for people who really needed the marginalized, bring their voices and be able to make them co-produce co the information they need to be supported and take, take care of their needs, their lived experiences into consideration. For example, the, the project we are doing in Pamtis, we are trying to get the lived experiences of those marginalized communities to see how they can benefit from adaptation. So at various stages, it's important to be able to also link adaptation to the people's physical vulnerabilities, and also to be able to make adaptation fund as just important as mitigation fund finances. Because at the moment, adaptation is not given ad adequate attention it deserves. But if we take care of adaptation just as mitigation, then you're going to reach more people who are marginalized and they're able to benefit that. And, and if we're able to bring the, the information research at the local level, we are going to reach those people who are marginalized and we're able to bring them on board. In that case, we we'll make sure that our adaptation efforts are effective and the people, people's livelihoods are improved and they are able to benefit from all that they need. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alice. There's definitely a lot for us to digest here. Um, and I think in the interest of time, what we're going to do now is we are going to move on to some questions from the audience, if you have any. So if you can raise your hand, if you have questions, what we'll do is we probably have quite a few online as well. Uh, three questions online. Okay. So if we can take maybe one or two from the audience here, and then Ellen can, if you can pick a couple as well from online. We'll do, so we've got one at the front 
here. And is there anyone else? Otherwise, we'll move on to the questions online. Um, OK, we've got one at the back as well. So we'll take two at, two at the same time. So if you, if you share your question, then we'll take the one at the back, and then we'll let the panelists answer. Thank you for the opportunity. This is, has been uh, extremely uh, helpful. There's a lot of websites shared uh, regarding uh, the information around the space. One quick question. The presentation so far seems uh, quite qualitative in its nature. Is there any quantitative data that can be shared as part of the research has been done so far? Hi. Um, nobody seems to have mentioned um, the issue of trying to regulate how different countries divide up their water sources. And if you take, for example, what's happened in Ethiopia, where they've dammed um, a large section of the Nile, and that's then denying um, countries further downstream certain water, how can that be legislated and arbitrated and discussed uh, amicably going forward. Um, I wonder if any of the panelists feel, or maybe if you can start with the first one about quantitative research and then in the second one, I guess maybe we have some other water experts in the audience who might be willing to answer. Uh, so on the first question. Oh, Bettina, you've got your hand up. Yep, if you would like to take the floor. Can I actually do the second question first? Oh yeah, brilliant, excellent. So it's a really good question, I think. It's one It's it's one of the things, uh, one of the aspects that um, is very complex. It really needs urgent attention. And um, maybe just to say we we've just we're just embarking on a very um, on a large initiative called Water at the Heart of Climate Action, looking at um, um, countries in a water basin um, sharing resources: Ethiopia, Uganda, Sudan, South Sudan, and Rwanda. Um, very challenging context to work in um, in some of these countries, but really looking at what is a climate action nationally? How does it affect? How is the effect between country? And, and quite importantly, in this aspect, um, in this project, also, how can we actually link the work that we're doing of the different partners? I think it's really something we can improve a lot on in general, um, to link academia, the humanitarian sector, um, the Netherlands Red Cross, the IFRC Climate Center, but also WMO, UNDRR, and SOF. So we really understand how we can not just um, have a, so a co-production process on the local level, but also how can we pool our resources, our understanding and our efforts um, interagency uh, wise. And I think it's a really important um, process to take forward. Here's a large initiative called um, Early Warning for All. It's a big UN um, um, initiative. And I think we'll see a lot more traction there. Um, and maybe while I am here, can I also um, answer the, the question that Charlotte has to say, how can we uh, scale up these uh, climate in, um, initiatives, adaptation initiatives? Co-production can take a lot of work and time. Um, and I want to say, absolutely, we need to get the mitigation um, the mitigation approach right, because we cannot adapt if we do not mitigate, we will reach limits to where we can adapt. But uh, it's really important that we include adaptation projects insights and really put that into social protection where governments are actually able, hopefully, to provide social protection to most vulnerable groups, to look at how we can actually integrate co-production processes into government policies and into government processes because I think we really need to reach scale and uh, we cannot reach scale by just having a million projects. I think we need projects but we need to have a concerted effort that is also really um, needs to be driven by policy and needs to enable what is happening on the local level that is driven by the local level. 
Thank you, Bettina. Would Doris or Alice wish to take the floor to answer any of the questions on that? Okay. Um, just to add on what Bettina said about the transboundary waters, that's a, a really big problem. Um, just for example, the Lake Victoria Basin, where there's lots of problems with transboundary water and conflicts. And so this is where science is really important in informing policy. So there's always a whole process of government sitting down in high level meetings when they have to form legislation. So it's a whole long process of cooperation really, really complex because there's a lot of trade-offs as well. So the relationship between the downstream and you know, the upstream uh, users. So on the first question about the quantitative um, work, um, this is very kind of a short meeting where it's really impossible to start you know, bringing all the, you know, our research, but I do quite a lot of quantitative research um, in the Tukana, the pastoralist community. So, for example, uh, there's one research that I did with the University of Glasgow looking at risks and how uh, pastoralists were perceiving risks. And so we went to did a really detailed quantitative survey in the households, understanding how climate was, uh, was um, affecting households, um, in fact, in, in, in terms of their incomes, and also counting the livestock that have died. So it's there, the quantitative work is there, and we need both quantitative and qualitative work. So whatever we are talking about here is actually based on in, in both mixed methods approaches. So really, really important. So I'm happy that you've erased that. But again, you know, we, it's something which is ongoing. Thank you. Alice, would you like to take the floor? Yes. Yes, thank you so much. I was just thinking about the transparent water resources. And uh, I felt that we need to find a way of legalizing or legislating the common resources. For example, when you have these transboundary water resources, a common resource for everybody. And maybe countries need to find having to subdivide it because everybody needs to use it. And we need to take the interest, particularly of the local communities that are dependent on these resources and they are they cut across different countries different areas and they should be divided by our 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 imaginary boundaries but they should be brought together under common legislation so that we use the resources as a common resource for everybody that is not my feeling but i, I maybe i may not be very right thank you Thanks. Thanks, Alice. Do we have some questions online, Ellen? Do you want to read them? Maybe one one for now, and uh, yeah, we'll just take I'm going to combine two questions okay. into one. So they're both about different sources of information. So one person, um, Carlotta, is interested in satellite data for climate-induced humanitarian disaster and how to bridge some of the barriers that prevent the usage of publicly available satellite-enabled data to make decisions in climate-induced disasters. But then there's also a question from Shahid about how to use local knowledge and how can this can how this can be effective for climate action. So we've got two different types of information, how those can both be used. Maybe I can uh, give this a, a quick go and then I hand over to my panelists. So um, I think it's really important to look at local knowledge um, and to see how we can really make sense of what the local knowledge brings, what the satellite data is, and, and how to really um, look at all types of knowledge that we have available to come up with the best course of action that we can. Um, I really think that uh, sometimes the local knowledge um, is, is really important to understand. And sometimes I think with climate change, we see extreme weather events where some of the local knowledge or the local practices maybe um, that used to work in the past are um, um, where, where local communities feel they are no longer robust enough to deal with what uh, climate extremes that we are facing right now. So this is also something I think we need to examine. Um, on satellite data, just to say, I think uh, we've really made huge progress in making more and more satellite data available. I think the real challenge is how to interpret and how to access the right information 
for your particular question. So the how do we turn information into actually knowledge that is an actionable that we need to navigate, I think, with great skill and urgency. I think those two questions are really interesting. And as uh, you said that uh, we've made a lot of progress in terms of collecting satellite data. Um, my experience in East African region, for example, there's quite a lot of regional uh, data collection databases that are being used at the moment. For example, rainfall data. And in fact, a few years ago, I evaluated a, a huge program called Prepared, which was funded by the Americans. And um, the scientists were producing different tools. So one of them was called um, Geoclimate, which is a database which was collecting satellite data on the climate hotspots across Eastern African region. And so this data, the, the only problem, the only challenge is how to interpret the data at the local level. So they still need to co-produce knowledge and try to make people at the local level. How do this knowledge, the certain data, um, like for example, a rain, a rain fed farmer somewhere in a village will use that information you know, to, um, to plan, for example, when they're you know, planting. So there's still a huge uh, disparity or if I say a gap between uh, satellite knowledge and, and, and local uh, indigenous knowledge. But I think there's a lot of progress as well. In Trukana, where I work, um, the indigenous people, the medicine and man are still really quite, um, they're quite valued in terms of predicting the weather forecast. But again, as I say that, you know, we need to still make these gaps, lessen these gaps so that, you know, they communicate with each other. Thanks, Doris. Alice, do you have any final um, responses? Yeah, thank you so much. I remember there's a time Ikpak in Nairobi was working with the, the local communities, the indigenous, the, they call them the rainmakers, to, to do joint forecast. And they found that actually they could work together and get the same results. I think that was a very successful example. And even today, we can still downscale the satellite information and other climate information, work with these local communities to, so that they appreciate what we are doing and what they are doing, and then be able to work together for better pre prediction. Uh, at the same time, I think we need to introduce climate information to younger generation working with the local communities so that they grow with this as part of their lives. As they grow up, they'll appreciate all the different diverse knowledge systems as they, as they continue using them on their, on their li daily life. At the same time, I believe that uh, we, we can also introduce this indigenous communities and indigenous knowledge into scientific knowledge that we are using for example, producing satellite information, they can still understand and co-produce with them. You sit in their social networks, bringing stakeholders that work with climate information together to appreciate more the, the value of scientific information together with indigenous knowledge. And then we have a more holistic approach to our use of, of climate information. To me, I think they can still work together and we can get some success on that co-production. Thank you. Thank you. That's a, a really uh, interesting and important uh, point to, to end on and it's also part of where we started on, on the importance of co-production so so thank you for this and there's lots of things that were mentioned today and we only had an hour it's quite a short time but I, I hope that at least it gave you some some points to to look to look at more um, more deeply and perhaps you know I urge you to check out the work that all of our panelists, that, um, that Alice, Doris, and Bettina are doing. I, I really urge you to, to look at their research. They've, they've published extensively, so do, do check out their work. And um, I don't know if there's much time to, to stay afterwards, but do have a, come and have a chat, a quick chat before we close. Um, 
Well, in fact, we are closing now, but I'd just like to say thank you to our panelists and thank you to Sakena and Ellen for introducing the, the today's session. And I'd also like to say that the next event organized by the museum as part of the Fair Water Exhibition is taking place on the 25th of April. Uh, it's on Clear Water, Clear Conscience. So do check it out and you can sign up online uh, at, uh, on the museum website. Thank you to all. And uh, thank you to our panelists and speakers. Thank you.